if you'll pipe down after your lunch, thank you. Okay, um, this afternoon's lecture uh, is um, to be given by Pierce Heath. Pierce is uh, relatively recently uh, part of the Fosters group uh, and heads up a new uh, division in, in charge of the environmental side of things. Uh, he does that having done his own practice, HCA or PHA consulting, uh, for quite a number of years before. And I think it's a particularly interesting somebody such as uh, Pierce to come because what makes Foster's unique as a practice, as far as I'm concerned, is the weird and wonderful locations where they have projects. Um, I don't think there's a point in the earth which hasn't got something going on with the Foster sign above it. And in terms of environmental design, that's a very interesting thing because each location brings different challenges which uh, he will describe. So as you're looking at this lecture, I think uh, that's the thing I would look toward is how different locations can bring such exciting approaches which then have an environmental consequence. So I'll hand it over to uh, Pierce and um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for, um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Is that, yeah. Um, well, thanks for coming to the, to the talk. I, uh, I felt that this title was probably the best to use, knowing that you're in your first year and you're probably being bombarded with all sorts of different advice and, and technical inputs from various people. And I felt that perhaps this, um, this might give you a fairly good grounding as to how we see things as we approach environmental design within what's a pretty significant practice internationally. And uh, as was introduced, they, um, they do tend to, as a company, work in a, a great many ranges of, of economic and climatic variants. Um, so across the years, from, from the very early days, you can, you can see and you're probably fairly familiar with some of the influences and impacts that Foster's had on, 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 develop, on the developing world and on, in our own country. Um, and in every project, there's been an issue or an aspect of, of design that has challenged and pushed the, the forefront of environmental design long before me and, and other people have been involved with, with Foster's. And as I said, it covers, that covers quite a, a, a range of um, a, a big part of the planet. And um, within it, we've identified some of, the, some of the key tools that tend to be used to, to identify and benchmark buildings against their overall sustainable performance. You're probably fairly familiar, I guess, with Briam from the UK, but maybe LEED internationally. Um, and there's a lot of funny projects around, some of which have, have good or bad credentials and are spoken about in the press in different ways. And, until they're up and operational and we have measurable data in terms of energy and water, it's quite hard to really quantify. Um, but they, most, most of these, these types of projects have an aspect that they're trying to address and not necessarily hit all the right buttons at, on, uh, at the start. Um, I've included a film at the back end when I've, I've co covered a case study for the bottom center image, which is the Mazdar project, feeling that you perhaps have heard of that. It championed zero carbon and zero waste as a city along back in 2006, I believe, it initially was discussed. Um, and it's an interesting project to, to look at. So what do we cover? What do we mean when we talk about sustainability and environmental design? You're probably, again, fairly familiar with the, with the three, the, the triple bottom line. Um, but the economics changed significantly, and, and we gradually realized after the, the banking issues that we had in, what, late 2008, um, that, that really, and in a lot of countries, there isn't the same budget as we might find in a, in a pristine headquarters development in, say, the centre of London. Um, and we have to consider these things quite carefully. And um, there's a range of issues and topics that you might filter into either both or individual elements of environmental, social, and, and economic. Um, but they're all measurable in one way or the other, whether it's a, a human thing, a well-being thing, whether it's financial, or whether it's actually constructible, constructability issues. Um, so I thought then I'll, I'll take you through some, some climatic regions. You're for, probably fairly familiar with the Copen diagram, which identifies the different regions of the world. And just, just taking China as somewhere that's pretty busy at the moment, there's a lot of projects um, fed out from London, New York, and other places that um, relate to sites in China. Um, it's a very different approach to, to, to project management and to dealing with clients in China. It's, it's significant. But what is really significant to us is the, the range of climatic regions. Beijing is probably closer to the upper image in terms of what's, if once you leave Beijing, that's pretty much the state of, of what's happening and the climate change is influencing that. It's getting drier and drier, yet the population of Beijing is increasing. 
Um, and then if you go to the southern regions, you have flood issues. There's the, you know, the tip of China hits them, the monsoons hit it. So these, these are significant differences and variations in, in what we have to consider. Looking at the timeline from 1880 on the left to, to 2000 and beyond, um, the general trend, trend of, uh, of, over land and ocean of, uh, of ambient temperatures increasing, global warming is, you know, it's a proven thing. You've, you've probably seen some, some presentations on that. I won't dwell for too long, but we should be aware that uh, long to the long-term life of our buildings and our designs is going to come, come into question in the future. I'm not sure this will run. This is actually meant to be a solar. No. It's a, a solar study to, to demonstrate how one has to appreciate the solar climate you're in, i.e. the latitude you're at. Um, and that may also be influenced by the degree of clarity you have in the sky, how much cloud cover you have through the seasons. These things heavily influence how you set out either master plans or individual buildings. Important to consider. Um, and then the topography can vary. I mean, this was actually a, a, it was in Croatia, and it was um, a luxury, um, a luxury, a sustainable retreat. I think luxury and sustainable are probably clashing a little. Anyway, um, it was on the tip of Three Sisters, which is that rock you see at the front. Um, but the, the topography surrounding the site meant that for some of the seasons where you really do want the sun, you don't actually get as much, as much sunlight as you'd like. These things are important to consider when you're looking at, at you know, interesting sites with, with um, interesting terrain around. Now, in terms of understanding the, the data you will get from programs like Ecotech to understand the climate, some of this is a little bit washed out, but if you... I'll use the pointer. Um, so we're going month by month. Each, each of these represent an average month. I'm showing you this in a bit more detail because I'm about to show you a variance across climates, which is important to understand this diagram, just in case you're not that familiar. So taking the sort of the mean line of temperatures, you can follow it through, through each of the months, and you can see the gradual increase. The comfort band is actually those two green bars, if you can vaguely make them out. And that's pretty much the human comfort band. Um, and in this case, we're looking at our city. Um, and you can see here, you can see the diffuse, which is the lower, the lower um, yellow uh, plot, and the upper one is the direct solar gain. So across the, each of the months, you can see the variation and actually how close our diffuse is to our direct. That's really important because direct solar is a thing that you're going to be worrying about and considering when you place windows, openings, transparency, atriums, whatever you might do for light that's where you're going to get your direct solar from. You know, this is how you're going to understand your direct solar. In terms of your load, there's a balance across the building in terms of the solar impact to your load of both direct and indirect, i.e. a diffuse sky, a cloudy sky. Um, and when you, when you muck around with the Ecotech package, you'll find that it, um, it pops out some, some interesting assumptions about what you can do or can't do in each of these climates that you might be looking at. Um, and it tends to go through things like thermal mass, thermal mass with night purge, arguably thermal mass without night purge is somewhat pointless, um, and then goes through the natural ventilation opportunities. In each climate, you'll be able to assess in this way. There's a lot of tools these days that will help you with it, but it's, it's how you interpret them and what you, what you do with them that's, that's more important. So I just um, gathered together some of the climates that we've been working in quite a bit recently. I mean, things have changed a little bit in the, in the Gulf region, but... Um, again, comfort band is somewhere sort of midway through those curves. You can see quite a big variance um, in terms of the noise it gives you about um, evaporative cooling. There is a potential for that. Some natural ventilation, believe it or not. But a lot of the year when you see, you know, it makes sense when you see the temperature below comfort band. Look at London. We just looked at that in detail, so you know that one. Um, Beijing, very, very dry. This doesn't actually show the humidity, but it is well apart from the, the evaporative cooling potential. But, but it shows you're way below comfort here. There's the comfort bar up here. Your temperatures are really cold, very dry, just by the way. Um, and the solar, oh, it's a bit washed out here, but there is a balance of direct and indirect, and it does vary across the months. So you can see a drop-off just after the peak summer solstice. All of these things will influence design. So come over to, to Mumbai, and suddenly you've got this very, very peculiar thing going on, which for environmental designers is, is very significant. The summer solstice is about here, I can't quite see, but it's about you know, the middle of the year. Um, and the monsoons tend to come in around about the beginning of June. So you, you, the temperature, you've got this huge diurnal swing, so you've got a good thermal mass, you can see this, you've got, evaporate, you've got um, you know, night purge thermal mass, you could use it, but really only for the two, sort of two ends of the year, the beginning and the end. Um, their, their summer pretty much, and I think they have their, the school holiday season, tends to come around this point because it gets super hot, very humid, Humidity builds right up, and then, it, then the, the skies, skies cloud over, and you get the monsoon for about three, three and a half months. 
Oh, that, that affects how you might consider your design for a building, because again, I think you could probably see here, um, you can make out the direct solar, which are these big spikes, the fuse sitting as quite a small curve underneath, and suddenly you get the monsoon, everything's gone diffuse. Suddenly you've got no direction to the sun that's going to affect your, your building design. But yet, the, di the dilemma you have is that you've, come, you've designed right up more or less to solstice, so the sun's nearly at its highest, you've got clear skies, very good direct sun, and then suddenly you've got diffusion. And, and you'll find that that will, that will change how the building characteristics might perform in that climate compared with Abu Dhabi that also has the humidity but has almost a more regular profile to the temperature and the, and the solar. Come to Kuala Lumpur, and you'll see in a sec when I show you some psychometrics, and I won't be too long on those, but I would like to show you. Um, here you've got a fairly small diurnal range. These temperature bands, by the way, I mean, it's a bit hard to see here, but generally that's about six degrees difference between night and day. The, the nighttime temperatures are still pretty elevated, but the daytime gets up to about 30, 35. That doesn't sound such a big deal until you add humidity. Um, uh, interestingly, I believe that's the evaporative cooling box. <laughs> it's surprising that it's showing that you can, you can evaporatively cool, because I don't believe that's correct. Um, either way, then look at New Mexico. Again, very dry climate, um, but very big diurnal range, and actually probably the, the, the highest of all of these, apart from um, the, the early year in Mumbai. Um, very interesting for thermal mass and evaporative cooling. Um, evaporative cooling actually shows less, but you see where, it, where it's coming. It has a, could have a big influence if it's coupled with thermal mass. And I'll show you a project at the end that, that looks to, to, to make good use of that. So that that's really gives you kind of some of the basic grounding in how you might respond to your climate. Now, engineers are going to bombard you with psychometrics or talk about it one way or the other because it's actually what makes a difference to how buildings perform when you come away from considering things purely from a passive point of view and actually start to look at the real energy meter and what's, what's really happening inside a building. Some of those climates, as you saw, you know, take Kuala Lumpur, it's going to be very hard to not treat that air before you pump into the building because it's too hot and too humid. Um, and I've just done a kind of beginner's guide to this. The graph is just about temperatures, the yellow and the temperatures, which are the, uh, the gradle on the base, the corresponding wet bulb temperatures, and this gives you an idea of obviously hot to cold. And then that's the moisture level. So we measure moisture up the left-hand side. So that's the, the amount of moisture in the air. Um, and then these bands represent what you're probably more familiar with is the relative humidity. So you're saturated here, 100% humid. And here you're at 10%. So your kind of riad is pretty much in the summer over here somewhere. Now in terms of energy, which I here got humid and dry, and I'll show you this only because I'm going to show you other climates, not because I expect you. Oops, not that I expect you. Oh. Right. So, again, same climate, same order. Now you've got humidity added to some of the basic data you've looked at. If you remember Abu Dhabi, didn't look too bad, had some, some diurnal, has some of this kind of fairly dry, you're down in the sort of lower humidity, but actually also has a lot of high humidity. Jump down to Kuala Lumpur. Now, the comfort zone, I've just used this one to, to highlight the comfort zone. This is what we might consider to be a comfort band that could be tolerable, depending on whether you're doing an office, a residential, a hotel, or a retail arcade, or an arts building, whatever. It would be somewhere within that band. But, but uh, Kuala Lumpur sits right up here where um, the humidity is very high, you know, from 100% down to what looks like about 60%. Um, and temperatures between 25 and 35. And it stays like that. And this is actually all seasons, all plotted together, and they come out as this big bubble. Here you can see the separation in seasons. It's clearer in, in Beijing. It gets very dry, but it gets very, very cold. But it's got a patch of the summer that probably represents some of Abu Dhabi's um, high end and uh, certainly some of Mumbai's. But Mumbai almost has the cluster that you can see in, in KL, in uh, yeah, Kuala Lumpur. Um, but, but you see a greater spread, so there's a portion of the year that is, is quite interesting. Now, that's all about the air state, and that's the air that you might bring into a building. So someone says to you, okay, let's come up with a great passive design. The first thing you've got to understand is how much of the year are you really going to make, make the building breathe, and, and actually, is that going to be good enough to maintain a decent comfort level inside a building? Because you bring the outside air in, and you add heat, people, computers, lights, whatever, and obviously, the temperatures tend to rise so, as a result in a sec, that, that shows, again, very dry, never gets up in the high humidity, so quite a different climate. And it's important to appreciate this because you are, I guess, going to be looking at projects all over the world and coming up and be asked to come up with 
different ideas and different responses to different climates. Then the importance of um, what we call sustainability, but I mean, sustainability is a very broad subject. I would say that in, in terms of environmental design, the environmental aspects of design as they, sit, as they sit within the measurement of sustainability, really important to think about them right at the beginning. The, the, the work stages that you may know from any classic training of how the work stages go, you have the, the very early stage right through um, developing your, your scheme as you go through to construction and completion on site, sometimes even post-completion assessment of buildings. If you start to entrain some of these clever ideas that you might have wished to have included and you bring them in too late, they tend to have a very significant cost impact on a project. Really important to get, get into those things right at the start and, 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 and uh, look at all the different things you can do. Um, the method of working, a little bit on integrated design, um, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. If, I don't know if any of you are, are coming to that discussion, but that would be more about integrated. And here what we're trying to describe is the, the significance and importance of working together as a team. It's deliberately exaggerated, obviously, but um, it's really important that all the components of the team sit together and help develop ideas as, as it relates to the previous graph in terms of how efficient you can be with those ideas. Um, put it together and work it, work it out well as a team and, and you have a cohesive approach. If you don't, and it's not always your choice, unfortunately, it's quite a difficult problem to resolve in some cases, um, but certainly when you're looking at projects, even, you know, even in the study process, it's really important to appreciate the particular disciplines that might Im influence the way you, you develop ideas. Um, at Foster's at the moment, we've, we've developed uh, the, the, an internal integrated approach to design which incorporates a whole range of disciplines and specialisms so as to not leave anything untouched in the early stages because without it, um, it's very difficult to, to go back and catch up with something that you might be suffering with uh, a lack of information, lack of performance from external consultants or even for a response from clients. Um, and, and having that strength is, gives you a, a greater ability to do it. There's a lot of uh, close working relationships with all the different key players within, within Foster's. Huge, pro huge company, lots of different individuals, lots of different skills and capabilities, and a vast range of nationalities, which really helps with uh, international projects. The, the process from start to completion, um, everything from, from raw ideas, I mean, you, you know, it's fine to see buildings when they're complete, but what goes into it to get there is, 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 a, is a hell of an exercise, and it's, it's almost, I would say it's almost more about managing your client and managing the brief and expectations and budgets in a way, unfortunately, than just pure design because it, there's a lot you want to be very good at in order to, to carry a good idea right through a project. And then, you know, how does, how does the process actually work? How could you map it out? And this kind of relates to the previous graph, but not so much about integration, really about how you can iterate between each of the, the key stages, which are kind of gateways in project terms. Um, there's a lot of significant things that get measured and get looked at. Sorry, this is a bit slow in coming up. Um, but really, you can see what it's saying, that in the very early stages, your ideas can be broad. Um, and those that really can come home to roost and give you a, either a very positive or a negative impact at a gateway, which I would say is the end of a stage, where you might have a cost plan, you might have um, construction issues you've got to bear in mind. Sometimes contractors are involved early, and they can, they can have a strong opinion on what you're trying to do. But to go through the process so that you keep a broad range of ideas together in the early stages and carefully hone and focus and see, see which ones are the most robust that you might want to carry forward. Um, and then what, you know, what, is, what is a good environmental or sustainable response? And in terms of measuring um, environmental gain, uh, you've probably seen the pyramid. It's, it's quite often used to describe these things. Um, but when you look at the classifications, utility scale renewables, you know, that's coming, that is there in a lot of countries. There's a lot of, you know, hydroelectricity has, has been around for a long time, but there's a lot of other measures being fed in. Um, the Gulf region is trying to do a lot of things, as you've probably read about, apart from the, um, the uh, nuclear plants. Um, and then as you go through, you've got smart grids, you've got smart appliances, you've got building controls, you just kind of headlines around those kind of topics. That you would sit in the management rather than the generation. And then you've got the conserving, which is really where a lot of the passive design, big movements can happen here. But in reality, um, this is an over-exaggeration, over-simplification of, of what really happens. 
and actually the reality is that you've got to understand what you can afford to do. And when I say that, I don't mean it just financially, but what can the site bear? What's gonna, what is going to be long lasting? What is going to be successful? Um, and the ideas tend to be quite a mixed bag, and that's, that's hence we use a different color of bubbles in the, in the box. But we're trying to identify that actually there may be really good moves. Say, for example, you're in, you're in Abu Dhabi and you're going to generate solar, you're going to have a solar farm. You're surrounded by you know, pretty, pretty cheap, relatively easily accessible land mass that otherwise doesn't have any development on. It's got a lot of sand blowing around. But you could easily come up with a, with a, with a, a photovoltaic or concentrated solar farm which could feed into plant and machinery that might be tri-generation that can give you then the power you need or the cooling you need to a local development. So that might be a bubble here that actually made sense because your solar yield is so significant that you could do something like that. But it is something you have to really understand. You can't, you can't just hear about an idea and apply it to a project that might not be appropriate because of constraints that, that you need to look into and, and be very aware of. Um, so in terms of measurement, I thought it was a good idea to kind of throw in a little bit on, on how we measure performance of buildings because it, it comes up probably way later for you guys, but um, it is important to understand what's, what's considered. One Planet Living, you might be familiar with the symbols that, that identify quite a range of topics, probably beyond, I guess, most of the, the Leeds and Briams. But all of these, all these topics pop up around the world. I think Green Stars Australia and Green Mark is Singapore. Um, LEED is pretty much international. It's almost becoming the, 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 the sort of benchmark tool used as a default tool for projects anywhere in the world. The French use HQE broadly based on BRIAM. And BRIAM actually derived, all of these were derived from BRIAM um, and Estadama in, in the Middle East. So what do they do? Well, they, they measure a whole host of things. Um, sorry about the tiny symbols, but whether it's recycling, the use of water, generation, um, natural ventilation, could be, could be anything, solar protection. And they, they measure them in different ways. So as an example of the US LEED rating system, you may, your building may look something like this. You come out with a, a very good score in transportation. You're right near a transport hub. You've provided all you can to make it easily accessible and easy to, to, get, to get around. Um, that might may be something you're doing clever within a master plan, who, who knows. Um, and then on other projects you might be doing, these are all doing quite well on transport, so I've already picked the wrong one. Um, but here, maybe on natural ventilation, you haven't, you, you, you've done something that, that, or you haven't been able to develop something that, that has maybe be, be performed better under a tool that you've then applied, whether it's something within a practice or, or a benchmark tool. These two being the, probably the most um, frequently occurring for project for firms based in the UK, LEED and, and BRIAM tend to be the tools we use the most. Um, obviously, a company like Foster's being so international, they've got to embrace all of these measures, so we tend to bring, bring all the tools we find and take, take the, the best and the most uh, interesting aspects of each. And how do you measure it? Well, I mean, you know, for quite a time, people were, <coughs> things were hard to measure in absolute quantities. You know, the, uh, the, the transport issue can be measured, but it's a little bit hard to use CO2, due to use distance, it's hard to do. Um, here, there's a life cycle example. Well, you know, if it's, uh, if it's got a long life cycle, you'd want to you'd understand, you know, how the, the longevity of your building and its componentry, is it going to be around for a long time? Is that really a sustainable thing to do? Um, and then categorizing each of them into, into you know, whether it's a, a, a site climatic response, a form of massing. And these, these do tend to come up at different stages. There should be materials in here, yeah. You know, materials, you might have an idea, but actually you're not really going to focus on that until a little bit later. You've got you know, a basic, maybe a structural form, but you might not yet have decided how you're going to finish the inside of the building or make some of the, the, the components of the building. Um, in terms of environmental systems, I would hope, particularly with the teaching here, that you guys would be so well aware of, of what you need to consider, and you really must consider a lot of these sorts of things. Um, internal configurations, obviously these are all interrelated. Um, the external enclosure and how that should be protected. And, and massing, if you're looking at a big master plan or you're plonking a, a development right next to some significant developments that are in a very windy, you know, say an Istanbul or a, a tough wind climate, you need to think about what it's going to be like around your building or what you might do to the neighborhood by, by planting a building there. Um, energy and water is obviously a measurement of a lot of those outputs, so um, they tend to be quite significant. Quite hard sometimes to, to pinpoint in early stages, but, but definitely needs to be thought about. Um, and so breaking that up into stages, just to take a sort of a, a kind of worked example, things don't, not everything survives, obviously, through, through the process. The more you think about in, in the early bits, probably BC is probably, so we're here we're kind of concept design. 
so it's say the first sort of 20% of a project, um, think about as much as you can and gradually um, bring them into the project and, and you know, as, as things get signed off through stages, you, 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 you pretty much, things become fixed, things become a definite uh, inclusion in the scheme. Um, specification tends to be where materials get enshrined. Um, over, over at Fosters, they have a whole materials group, and we look at this quite seriously. A lot of firms do that. You have to, you have to look at um, new and developing materials, composites, and so on, and they all can be measured in different ways. Um, and we use a lot of design tools. I, I, I'm not sure all the tools you'll be looking at, but there's, there's a whole range of tools available, whether it's thermal imaging, uh, wind profiling, uh, load, load, load um, configurations, um, and, and there's, a, there's a great many tools available. There weren't before, and there's a, there's a lot of things that uh, help you understand what otherwise you might have thought from a common sense point may have led you to a conclusion. You need the tools to, to prove it out. Um, I'll take you through Mazda as a, as a case study. Um, I believe these slides are mainly focused on the, the first building. They're, they're probably fairly big files that might be taken out. Um, so Mazdar is a site that is just south of the airport um, in Abu Dhabi. Um, interesting location, a lot of sand issues around the site. There's still a lot of development going on. Things slowed down, as I, as I was saying earlier, that uh, the, the world has changed a little bit, particularly the region, and so obviously it's gone through those changes. Um, in terms of One Planet Living, which was set out as objectives for Mazdar as it started, you can see some of the topics there that they that they raised. I mean, is it, you could, almost the headlines from Mazda, I think, were more or less driven from, from discussions with, with One Planet, with the, um, with the organization. And, you know, there's a lot of things in here. There's a lot of hidden messages behind some of these, these headline topics. Sustainable transport became a very big issue for Mazda, and they looked at um, the PRT, which I think is on the film at the end. Um, but calling it a zero waste, zero carbon city were, were headlines that were shouted about for the last two or three years. Um, a really tough thing to do, and in that climate, a huge task. So the city is made up of a number of components. The uh, MIST, the project I'll show you, is right in the center here, and it's the, uh, actually, it's, over, it's here, sorry. Um, it's the Mazda Institute of Science and Technology. Um, and the very first stage included, it just in component form, in, it included a, a generating roof. The entire city, everything has to have a generating roof on it, and that is, I tell you, such a learning curve as to what it takes to get photovoltaics across the roof of a building, a lot more than you would think. Um, it has a large component of laboratories that sit more or less in the center of the master plan for MIST, for MIST 1A, um, and then student accommodation around the perimeter with atriums that link up the accommodation, and a knowledge center um, positioned interestingly off the grid. Um, the whole city was orientated by 45 degrees for the street channeling, and I'll show you towards the end of this uh, the impact that had. Um, and that did lead us to a lot of wind studies, so we built a model at, uh, um, at a, I think this was a 250 scale, no, this was more, this was actually, I think, 1250 scale. Um, and that was to test the blue area being missed in the middle of the, 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 the um, overall city development to understand what's happening with winds. And the green channel down here, you'll see in some of the further images, that's actually the main park spine. There's two of these, and they help to channel wind into the city, into the heart of the city. The thing is that you're working almost against yourself here, because you want really narrow streets in order to keep the shading to the streets so the temperatures stay low, but also you'd like some breeze in there because it's so hot and humid during a period of the year that you want to relieve that. And there's lots of techniques of, for doing that, whether they're down, passive downdraft where you evaporate into the, into the uh, cylinders, or they're, they're um, wind scoops or cooling towers. There's, there's a number of different things that you can do. But the overall issue we have is that in terms of ambient conditions, um, just, just taking this, as, this is actually the international recognized um, rating, and it's, it covers all sorts of, um, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the human race, so um, there's quite a range of, of tolerance that, that might vary the, the model. So it's, it's, meant to be, um, it's meant to be a balanced view. Um, but this is actually the year, so you're in January here, so December over here, that's your summer period. You remember back to the psychometrics and temperature profiles, it's a tricky time of the year, but other times are not so bad at all. And then when you look at the effects of doing something like this, where you might increase the ventilation and you, you um, spray humidify into um, fairly high ambient temperatures that might not contain, they might not be up to 80, 90% humidity, and you've changed the graph. So if I go back one, look at the change in the, in the orange zones. So that intervention in a public space, say for example, say in a courtyard, maybe not internally because your humidity would go too high, 
but you can really change the comfort perception of a of of of, um, of a development within that within that climatic region just by using some of these these tricks. That was some of the early visual visualizations of of what we were trying to do, but I think uh, it, it moved on a little bit from there. Um, and then, you know, how do you deal with solar? Well, okay, I'll, you'll see the narrow streets and, and how, we've, how we've dealt with that there. Um, but interestingly, you've got to understand that you're at a high solar altitude in this particular location. Um, we moved the library, the knowledge center, off-grid in order to have a broad facade, which otherwise we couldn't have had because when I say off-grid, I mean we moved it to a south-facing. South-facing is actually quite good in most climates. depends where you are in the world. But it's pretty good because it's simple to show. The sun's usually fairly high in the sky. Again, you know, if you're northern latitude, that, that's tougher. Um, it's fairly high in the sky, and the east and west become the flanks that are more difficult to deal with because the sun's either coming up or going down. And for the residential, we kind of went back to the basics of understanding how you could mask and how you could deal with, uh, with, with the requirement for illuminance. I'm pretty sure it's a luminance plot require for illuminance within the residential, but actually create a, a barrier to direct solar gain. And that's where you saw the screens on the front, which are actually um, uh, glass-reinforced concrete. Um, and they're panels that are clipped onto the front of the residential unit. So the condition zone is actually anywhere back from that line. And these are some of the options of how one could, could achieve a better level of illuminance, a more balanced level of illuminance, um, with external shading beyond your, your, your main frontage. Um, and again, obviously, a careful appreciation of solar angles. And these are some of the models of the output. That's actually taking it down to the ground plane. So there's many retail and lab entries and so on at the ground plane. The residential all starts at first floor. So all of these things are very carefully balanced and tuned with, with all sorts of different tools to try and make sure that we've covered the right kind of approach and we don't end up with something that might be a barrier to some but actually re radiates so much heat that it's actually working against you. Um, but our main concern here, and this, this, in this particular case, I think we're about 4.3 meters to the, to the next soffit, so they're very tall. They have kind of mezzanines at the back. But to introduce light into the soffit, we had a, a clear story opening above the ledge so you can bounce light up onto the ceiling, but then shade your main, your main frontage. And the components come together, they're all GRC, that clip onto the front of the concrete boxes. Um, just the headings along the top just give you an idea of, of what that includes. So you've got recycled aluminium, so there's a materials value in there. You've got the main properties. Level of seal, this is really tough to deliver in some climates. It all sounds wonderful when you read it out of the manuals, but actually really tough to get the construction quality to get to that level. Uh, for a long time in London, buildings didn't get beyond about 10 meters cubed per meter squared per hour, just to give you an idea. Um, it is t it's a tough one. Um, solar screens, ventilation, um, actually ventilated cavities, sorry. Uh, and then the, the, the material content. And how that then gets developed up in, in construction components, how they're fabricated and brought to site. And now um, the overall photovoltaic installation that <coughs> sits over the roof of the, of the laboratory buildings and then also over the bars of residential within the residential zones. Um, we also include um, generation on top of the, the library. Um, but all of these, you can just see to the level of analysis that goes into even considering this is actually an atrium down the center of each of the, 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 the sort of spinal areas of the, of the residential. And all of those are naturally ventilated with top-up cooling as heat rejection from, from surrounding functions, whether it's retail, lobbies, um, or the, the clean air of the, of the offices for the labs. So it's, it's kind of, if you like, waste cooling, if, if you can use that term, goes into these central zones. And then each of the individu individual boxes have the ability to condition themselves, but with the screening and the ability to naturally ventilate, they can also have that, that green portion of the, of the climate year, as you saw on the earlier graphs, to, to naturally ventilate themselves. Exhaustive solar studies and shadow studies to see how, how the buildings perform and, and what method of shading works for the different orientations. Um, but all of these lead you to a solution that kind of works collectively with with the architectural aspirations, what's physically possible in construction terms, um, and obviously particularly what, what's actually giving you the greatest level of benefit. These are the laboratory fronts. I mean, quite a lot of debate and could go on for ages about whether it's appropriate to put um, uh, PTFE in front of uh, an insulated barrier, but it's, um, it was mostly to do with reflected heat. There was a, I think it was an aluminum clad solution that was considered at one time, but 
We had the narrow streets of, of, of Mazda, or of Mist in particular, and we were finding that there was so much reflected solar gain coming down into the streets that it negated the benefit of narrow streets with you know, tall canyon type streets. Really heavily shaded because of the load density you need in laboratories, so these are not residential. Tall floor to floor because you've got all the laboratory equipment, you've got a lot of uh, mechanical stuff going on in the ceilings. Floors tend to be solid in, lab in labs, obviously, because of spillage and, and leakage. Um, and so the consideration we had here was to try and use the ETFE cushions to minimize the amount of reflection um, and avoid the, the direct impact on the public spaces, which are down below. And again, comes together in component parts. And along the top, you can see some of the, some of the key headings. Sorry, this is a bit slow. Now, the toughest thing here, because, because of the nature of the load in the building, was actually achieving that. The residential wasn't so critical, because it's kind of on-off, if you like. It's residential, so people aren't there through the day as much, but it uh, tends to be an on-off system and allows for natural ventilation. In a laboratory atmosphere, you can't do that. So you're in the same climate, so you have an issue here that you need to really seal up the building, keep a good therm thermal break around the building. Buildings actually can sweat from the outside or from the inside, depending on what climate you're in. In this case, you're cooling on the inside, so clearly, the outer layer, if it's seen by the outside humidity, could, could develop moisture. So, so the detailing and how that all comes together becomes quite a, quite a big part of the, of, the, of the construction technique. And that was a, a mock-up test, which um, certainly the architects uh, were very excited about. I'm not entirely convinced it's the prettiest facade. But, um, then the, the pressure testing. Um, there's, there's a lot of cladding testing that has to go into these sorts of things, so you understand and, and know how it goes together in, component, in the multiple component form, and then it goes off to get construction, constructed on site. So there's a lot of testing goes into these, and you need to pass in each of the key aspects of measurement, whether it's filtration or load testing, wind resistance, and so on. And that was actually before the ETF is applied, so that's with this reflective mode. So the streets and the key sort of design aspect, if you like, of, of how the master plan comes together. I mean, I'm not probably showing you the best view here, but the, the, the narrowness of the gap between the laboratory and the residential frontage leads to, and, and the twisting of the, of the footprint of the overall master plan at 45 degrees from north-south to uh, northwest, uh, sorry, northeast-southwest. And, and that leads you to a much better solar profile on the streets and on the facades. The outside of the city obviously would effectively be seeing more sun because as you twist it around, you've now got, you've now got the northeast, the southeast, the southwest, and the northwest, and the sun can see all those four sides. But the benefit to the streets are so significant that it just means you've got to shade your outer screens on the, on the, on the perimeter of the city as best you can. This city is meant to be developed in stages, and therefore adjacent buildings would cover some of that shading. But there is a challenge when you look at master plans and look at individual buildings because they don't always uh, lead to the same result. And you can see the photovoltaic oversailing the buildings there. I mean, incredibly expensive. And I don't think if this project would start from scratch now, I, I, I think that would be a photovoltaic farm out in the desert, not on top of buildings. So quite techy buildings internally. So a lot of things to incorporate leads to quite a different solution when you, when you look at the comparison between labs and offices. Um, and some of the things they're researching there, I mean, the, 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 the wonder of, of MIST is that they are looking at everything from the, um, the transport systems that are all electric and unmanned um, to developments in, in concentrated solar, the, 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 the beam down system, um, and a number of other different technologies. This is part of our courtyards. We incorporated this as part of the scheme, but it's actually a passive downdraft tower. So we have a wind tower, the inlets that sit to capture each of the directions of wind that are available in Mazda. Um, they, it sits well above the, the rooftops of Mazda. Um, and then the tube in the center has evaporative spray within it. Now, you can't use it all year because it's too humid for a portion of the year. But there's a great benefit when you've got high solar gains down in the courtyard, which is a more open space. And then you've got the cool spray coming down from the, from the downdraft uh, through, the, through the towers. Um, we've been back onto the site here and, and examined how temperature, this is quite interesting, if you look at a thermal plot. So, I mean, if anyone's walked around Abu Dhabi at, uh, in high season, you tend to run across the road to get into the shadow of a building. Um, building frontages at 38, Ashfield at 57, then flip over to Mazda and do the same thing. And this is actually, I think, in the courtyard. Uh, just a second. Uh -huh. And so, similar thing here, you've got wet ground at 27, dry ground, 
with shade, obviously it's a shading impact. I think there's one in a moment with, with the sun as well. Um, but com same time of year, same time of day, and here's a parallel study. So here's the canyon streets we were talking about. Um, so ground surface at 33. So the benefit of the master plan twist, if you like, at peak season has delivered, or peak solar time, has, um, has delivered such a huge gain. I mean, that's like 24K between the, between the two street surfaces. Um, and then an overall radiant temperature within that space that you can measure with a, with a globe thermometer. Um, that you can see, you, you know, it's a really significant difference. So, you know, master planning can have a huge impact. I thought I'd just finish with taking you through Spaceport, um, very uh, personal project that I was involved with right from the, from the initial competition that, that uh, changed the brief as it, as it went. It was going to be a lot larger originally and then became a single building. It's um, developed within the um, Spaceport, uh, the New Mexico Spaceport Authorities region, um, and it's quite near some of the uh, missile testing ranges, but it's, uh, when you go to the site, you realize how remote it really is from, from normal civilization. Um, and uh, we had to study quite carefully how, how and what would be included in a building of this nature and why is the response, you know, what, what's sustainable about sending people into space? Obviously, we're going to be burning up rocket fuel and jet fuel to get them elevated and then launch the rocket from, from an elevated position. So, you know, there's a lot of argument to, to, uh, for or against this, but it was more about people being able to, they only actually go into space for about four or five minutes, um, but the, the vision and impact it has on you emotionally and philosophically when you go and see the planet for yourself and you understand just how delicate and sensitive everything's balanced. And so that's really considered as the big message behind, behind uh, the, 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 sort of the sustainable aspects of and what, why we should re reflect sustainability in the, in the building. Um, so that's what it became at competition. It's one of the competition images. But there's a lot of hard work went into developing ideas. Now, the reason I showed you climate at the beginning is because I wanted to be able to explain a project in the context of a climatic response. So here we have, again, the temperature bounds here at uh, kind of a, a what would be considered normal human comfort. It rises slightly in the summer and drops off in the winter. But look at this massive day to night temperature difference through the winter months, shoulder season, still big difference in day to night. Even in the summer, you're dropping well below comfort level um, and coming up above that during the daytime. And then a similar reflection on the other side. So the response was to, um, we wanted to create something that really sat in the land and um, didn't impact the, 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 the terrain, which is, I mean, it's flat, it's, it's flat with, with, um, um, with kind of uh, rocky terrain, I'd say, is the, the nearest form that isn't flat. Um, they all call it blown dirt on the surface. Actually, it, it does rain, and you do get some growth on the site, but it's, it's pretty much semi-arid. Um, Solar gain, you know, I mean, you can almost see the same solar gain right through the season. So, you know, and it's one of the reasons the site was picked is because the skies are clear virtually the whole year, apart from those few occasions when it rains. The only time I went to site, it rained, which was uh, surprising. But anyway, we, um, we examined all sorts of things at competitions. So here's an image that went in with a competition. So it gives you an idea of what you try to include and what actually finally got built. Sorry, that's, that's also a comp competition image. So what we do here is we, we consider that this diurnal range gives us an opportunity to both have thermal mass acting for us within the spaces, but also making use of it as a, as a charge means for the air that comes into the building. So we incorporate a thermal labyrinth within these, these two kind of lungs, if you like, to the building. Um, there's a hangar in the central space. So a lot of that central bulge is where the, the uh, white knights that carry the rockets um, sit within the hangar. And so that only uses a simple radiant system because with that temperature range, if you open the hangar doors, you're pretty much going to experience that. So for people to be able to service this kind of equipment, you, you know, gloves or not, and whatever suits they might, might be wearing in a workshop, you need to maintain some, some comfort in there. So we incorporate um, a, a, um, a, uh, a serpentine of pipes buried in the ground for thermal exchange to a heat pump that can then deliver either heating or cooling back through a radiant system in the floor of the building. But it's all directly related to how the climate works. Um, the dryness of the air, you never get anything up here in the sort of uh, unfriendly, humid and hot region. So it allows us to do all these stories. I didn't realize I had to blow up here a bit. Um, simple sketch, but it's a, it was a sort of competition level sketch. And the most of the front of the house areas and training areas for the astronauts, they walk across, the, there's a kind of viewing platform, walk, walk right across the top of the, the hangar area and have portholes to look down to the, to the aircraft. Um, and then come to uh, they have, a, I think, a two-and-a-half-day induction course, and then they, they go off up in their, their trip. 
Um, but to measure performance, and, and actually in this case, because you're in New Mexico, you're in the US, so everything's measured by lead. I mean, lead pretty much affects any building you ever do in the States these days. Um, and uh, to, to get, I mean, here we're showing, what's that, a 36% reduction. So you're told your baseline, as an engineer or an architect, you're told your baseline, so you've got to be better than that in order to get different scores as you go through the lead process. But incorporating our, our proposed base, um, which deviates from, from a default baseline, the inclusion of earth tubes that feed the air into the building, um, adiabatic cooling that then trims the air, so that's spray cooling into the airstream that goes into the conditioning systems for the space, no actual mechanical conditioning included, um, and the sun, solar thermal heat recovery, uh, and, and the daylight link controls to all the, all the artificially lit spaces. Obviously, you've got nighttime issues, so you need to be able to control the lights. But all of that work and all those clever ideas, in reality, overall, when you put everything together, you've got to understand that you know, you don't, you know, getting to zero carbon is a long way down the line. So um, just to give you an idea of the reality of it. Um, we had quite a challenge here that we were facing east. So when you come into the front of house area for training and for families to, to, to watch as the different trips uh, leave the runway, the runway is actually east of, the, uh, of, of that facility. And that's the low angle sun problem. So you've got all that direct solar gain you saw from the charts pounding your, your eastern facade, and yet you want views. So it's one of the worst conflicts you have. Um, so the facade was developed mostly around glare control. You can control solar gain through either shading, which could arguably obstruct your views, obviously, depending where you put it, um, or through the, the control of the glass. You know, glasses that, um, that are heavily tinted and not so popular these days, as I'm sure you know, um, but they could be reducing the light transmission to 50%, but 50% is fine. You'll see everything in that bright light outside. You'll see it all. The issue then is glare. You know, do you, you know, most people wear, wear sunglasses throughout New Mexico pretty much, but um, you want to be able to look out and see what it is you've come to see. So it's an important uh, conflict between solar angle, physical arrangement. You, know, you can't change the site. Um, and, uh, and what you gain from it. Interestingly, the rockets, when, they, when the white night leaves, it leaves flying um, from uh, uh, south to north, and then the high-level winds at 55,000 feet, I mean, some of you are probably more aware of these things than me, the winds change, you're in a different direction of winds, and actually you have to almost go onto the roof of the building to see what, what happens, because they, they launch in at uh, 90 degrees difference to the, to the takeoff angle. Um, and so, you know, the, the assessment of what the roof accumulates, you know, can, how much of the photovoltaic could we incorporate where it's thin film as a layered system on the roof, um, trying to create a sort of mark of sustainability for a building of this significance or importance um, was, was a big challenge with a budget that was around $26 million, I think it started at. Um, really, to do some of these things from our experiences at Mazda, uh, you need a lot bigger budget to do that. I mean, you're probably another half again to, to do some of those things. So most of the techniques that were incorporated in this particular project use relatively simple, long, you know, well-known and well-proven techniques of passively reducing the impact of outside air. So taking the air down through the lungs of the building, through the labyrinth, and feeding it back up into this oversimplified sketch, but, but that's, that's pretty much the principles of what we then model through all the days of the year, all the hours of the year in this case. Ambient conditions are doing this, but the labyrinth is steadily giving us these earth tubes, are steadily giving us a, an even balance. That's the, that's the kind of sample shot of what they look like. I think I have one of the, of the th this is actually a different project, but I'll show you in a sec. So, you know, modeling has to, has to really understand what you're getting from this. It, you know, it's like we said in the beginning, to have lots of these great ideas, you've got to be able to demonstrate fairly early on that they're robust. And in this case, we're looking at the depth of tubes buried below the ground, so your terrain's going to become important, um, and, and the, um, the, the temperature difference or temperature impact you can have um, at those various levels. So do, if you say if you went for a two-meter depth, at an ambient of, of 20 degrees, you can see that you're well, actually probably with all of the, with this entire range, which pretty much picks out the climate range that we're interested in, you can see you, you hit a kind of optimal depth at about three to four meters. The cost of, I mean, you know, ideally you'd like to be at seven, but you know, there, isn't, there isn't that luxury when you're in, on, a, on a fairly plain surface. In reality, we're actually at about two meters depth, um, just the cost of excavation. And here you can see the, the, the tubes going into the ground there's the two lungs for the buildings. The main entrance, the, the buses and the arrival point is here. That's the main apron. And then your front of house, your hangar through the center there. And that's most of back of house offices and uh, for the spaceport authorities. And then your runway out here. 
really strong natural light. I mean, the sun is just so strong over there. You, it's incredible what you, what you can do with it. Um, that's still a competition image, but it's pretty much what's been built. Again, a competition image. But a really exciting and interesting demonstration of fairly simple passive measures in a building that's got some pretty high-tech equipment going through it. So that, that was that. And I'm just going to make sure I can exit this and run a little film for you to have a look at, which is actually of Mazda. We had trouble getting this running earlier on. It's just got music background to it, but um, it, it sh takes you around the project eventually. So there's, there's no sound, so it's a silent movie in this case. So location, that's pretty much what's built at the moment. We've, we've built two phases so far, but you can see as you enclose the, the science center with all the other developments, that large building in the center is meant to be the headquarters. It's been reduced a little bit since then. On the periphery of the site, they have all the testing facilities. So, for example, if you're developing an interesting <coughs> new technique that requires a, a large assembly, you'll see them, they'll be shown in a sec. They're on the periphery of the, of the city. So some of the residential accommodation. These are obviously models, but it's, you know, it's, it's pretty much built out as this. I think there's some real footage at the end. It's all, the, the entire city had been developed on a, on a podium with the, the rapid transit, the personal rapid transit system below it. Uh, there's our wind tower, some of the research work that they'll be looking at. And that's actually nearby, that's an installation that's already there. The docking stations for the PRT, so that's down below, it's actually at grade, but it's below the podium you're seeing people walk on. So these are all remote controlled, so that's all uh, automated. And as I said, I mean, I think if this project were to come your way at this point in time, economics are different. I think this would more be built directly off the ground and probably would incorporate the PRTs within the street scene. As narrow streets, you get a feel there for how little sun actually gets down into the street, but enough light to, to with the reflection from the, the light reflection from the labs. And this is the green finger that goes down the center. There's the library on the left. Knowledge Center, which is deliberately twisted, as I said, 45 degrees to face south. And that's the, that's the completed 1A, so you see the wind tower there on the left, which is sit, sat right in the courtyard, the main courtyard of the building. And the labs actually pinch up to the perimeter. You can see even here, with, with nothing built around it, they're still very well shaded and protected. The testing centers some of the office spaces and then the, the facilities. These are more at the periphery. They're not yet, I think there may be one or two of the enclosures built, but these, these are where they're testing the different uh, elements that are being developed within the city. And the city is still going ahead piece by piece, but I, I tell you the recession really slowed it, or the, the constraints in, in the Middle East really slowed things down. You can see the overall configuration of the site. So the airport's to the right on that image and the various different sponsors. So I hope that wasn't too dry and too clinical on the technical side, but I thought it was good to communicate some of those things because I'm sure you're going to face up to them as you look at projects. Great. Thanks very much.